My name is Ethan Vesley Flad. I'm Director of National Organizing at the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns, and I am joining you this evening from Asheville, North Carolina, which is the ancestral land of the Eastern Band of Cherokees. I'm so grateful uh, for all of you to be with us this evening for this special conversation, and especially to our guest, uh, my friend and um, uh, my former colleague at FOR for a short period of time, um, a, a great prophetic uh, speaker and writer and thinker, the Reverend Dr. Susan K. Williams Smith. Um, Susan is the author of several books, uh, and most recently, um, this book that we're going to be discussing this evening. It's called, titled With Liberty and Justice for Some, The Bible, the Constitution, and Racism in America. And I really will encourage each of you to consider purchasing this book, especially if you can, uh, through your independent local bookstore um, or Judson Press directly. Um, we're grateful to Judson um, for both publishing this really important book um, and for their partnership with this program. And those are great ways to support the press or your indie bookstore. Uh, you can also uh, purchase it through Susan's uh, website, um, Crazy Faith Ministries, which has a link, I believe, uh, directly to your Amazon page. Uh, and that's another great way to support Susan and her writing and teaching. Um, I would like to start our conversation with this evening with a brief prayer um, from Howard Thurman, um, who Susan, you cite in the introduction uh, to your book, um, and who uh, is um, um, an amazing uh, figure and writer, uh, preacher, um, leader, and uh, one we certainly are blessed to claim as part of FOR's great uh, lineage. And um, this prayer um, uh, is titled, I Confess. The concern which I lay bare before God today is my concern for the life of the world in these troubled times. I confess my own inner confusion as I look out upon the world. There is food for all. Many are hungry. There are clothes enough for all. Many are in rags. There is room enough for all. Many are crowded. There are none who want war. Preparations for conflict abound. I confess my own share in the ills of the times. I have shirked my own responsibilities as a citizen. I have not been wise in casting my ballot. I have left to others a real interest in making a public opinion worthy of democracy. I have been concerned about my own little job, my own little security, my own shelter, my own bread. I have not really cared about jobs for others, security for others, shelter for others, bread for others. I have not worked for peace. I want peace, but I have voted and worked for war. I have silenced my own voice that it may not be heard on the side of any cause, however right, if it meant running risks or damaging my own little reputation. Let thy light burn in me, that I may, from this moment on, take effective steps within my own powers to live up to the light and courageously to pay for the kind of world I so deeply desire. Susan, uh, it's just a great honor to um, take this time to talk with you about this, this thesis that you bring before us, this argument. Um, I guess it's a series of arguments, really. <laughs> um, and um, as I said, um, in the int int introduction, you cite um, Howard Thurman's work and so forth. And, and there's just, I think, a lot to bring into um, into that as we delve into the book. But I, I think I'd, I'd love to start, if you would, um, you're located in the greater Columbus area, a place that's really sacred to me, um, to my own ancestral lineage, um, 
My uh, maternal grandparents lived there in Columbus for many years. Um, and I wonder if you would share a little bit about your own um, sense of rootedness in that place and in that region. And maybe it might uh, lead us, in fact, to um, you talking about what led to really taking on this significant book project. Okay, well, thank you, Ethan. And it is um, an honor to be here with all of you. It's an honor to see and hear my friend, Ethan. Um, it's always good to connect with good people. And so I thank you for that. And it's good to be with FOR, an organization which I really love and respect. Um, you know, I was actually born in Ohio. I never talked about it because um, <laughs> I didn't claim Ohio is my home place. I was born in Akron, Ohio and um, actually grew up in Detroit and was, um, after I graduated from seminary, was working in Chicago at Trinity United Church of Christ when Jeremiah Wright was the pastor. And um, I knew it was time to leave. You know, you can be in a place, you know how it is. You can be in a place and then know it's time to go. And I knew it was time to go. And so I ended up um, coming to Columbus, Ohio, the church that I pastored, I no longer pastor it, but the church that I pastored was, had five members and um, it was quite a challenge. And, you know, the denomination, the United Church of Christ thought that it was going to be a church that died. And, you know, I, I don't even know, you know, I just felt like God told me to go there. So we had five members and I was the pastor and I was also the choir director. And so I would have the choir sing and then I'd have them leave the choir area and sit down in front of me. So I would have someone to preach to. Um, that's how we started. And we, uh, it, something that had been begun by the denomination. And so I was there for 22 years. Um, but, you know, I always had a love for, um, I always had a love for pursuing justice. I don't know that I called it social justice at that point, but pursuing justice. And I just really loved reading all the stuff um, about history. And, and I was particularly interested in, in racial stuff because, um, you know, there's so much in school you didn't learn. So I was always reading um, I read so much stuff about race relations and the history of, 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 of race in this country and things that we didn't learn in school. So it was a natural thing for me to um, work for social justice. And, and this is what I understand. Um, I see Christy's on this, on, this, on this call. I'm so glad to see her. But there, social justice is not just racial justice. It's all kinds of injustices. And so I had I, I was involved and have been involved in social justice, but I uh, work. But I also know that I have come to understand that my particular corner of it is the racial social justice. You know, there's women's rights and reproductive rights and, you know, LGBTQIA. You can't, you know, I, I, I learned if you try to do all of that, you'll just lose your mind and you won't be effective at anything. And so I have claimed my little neck of the woods, my little neck of the woods and do my best in, in that area. Um, and because um, I've, I've been immersed in, at, you know, I, I, Chrissy and I work with Poor People's Campaign and, you know, poverty and race, all that's all related. Um, it, it just, it just made, when you study stuff and you, and you watch what's going on in the world around you, and then you go back to what you have studied and, and read, you know, you add two and two and, and four, the number four never comes up. It never comes up because what's going on doesn't gel with what has been the history. You can't make it work. And what happened um, is I can remember the day I was thinking, I was reading something and I remember the day that it just almost, um, it just almost made me break down. I said, how in the world can um, anybody call themselves a Christian and go out on a Saturday night and lynch somebody? And then go to church on Sunday morning. I just, it was just like oil and water. I thought, what the heck is that? How can you do that? And what, what guided me and, and provoked my question was um, the teachings that my mother, who's my very first theologian in my life, my mother taught me. She, she said, you know, we were watching what was going on on television in the South, in Alabama, with the dogs and the hoses and all of that. And we were like, 
flabbergasted that anybody would do that to anybody. Um, and she was watching and I can remember her yelling out from the kitchen. Yeah, I know it hurts your feelings, but you got to love them and forgive them anyway, because that's what Jesus said to do. Oh, oh, that was my first um, my first time really hearing it put that way that, you know, to be a Christian wasn't something in name only, but it's being a Christian was something that you actually had to do. Um, and so I, um, I don't know, it made an impact on me. And when I thought about that, when I thought, you know, I, I read these, these stories about these so-called devout Christians who were just rabid racists, I thought, what in the world is going on? And so, um, I, I look at our situation and I looked, you know, in this country, what we have, I, I said, we have two sacred texts to the Bible and the constitution. Whenever anything is going to go on, we quote the Bible or the constitution, or we quote them both. Now we don't obey either one of them, but we quote them. We find ways to get around them. But the fact of the matter is, is that we quote them. And if there were, was ever a move to, you know, redo the Constitution or rewrite the Bible, there would be the people talk about civil war, there would be a civil war. People would never stand for that. So it's interesting to me that we have these 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 documents that we hold as sacred. Everybody talks about the Constitution, you know, everybody and everybody lifts up the Bible and nobody is listening to or abiding by the words contained in either one. And so that's what really prompted me to write this book. And, and somebody asked me the other day, are you finished with this? I'm not. It seems like writing this book was like step one. It seems like I need to go deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Um, and hopefully uh, people will read it. I, I have these fears sometimes, to be really honest, with the way the country is going. And I don't know if, if there's going to be. We're going to be allowed to read what we want to read, watch what we want to watch. I, have, you know, right before the 216 uh, election, I was in Germany and I was looking at all the things that happened before, you know, the Nazis came into power. And the one thing that got me, uh, Ethan, was oh, seeing the pictures of them burning the books. I just thought, oh, my goodness. And so that that nightmarish picture stays with me. And I don't know what's in ahead of for us in this country, but in my heart, I feel like I have to keep writing and writing and writing as much as I can before I leave this earth. And hopefully someone will, you know, read it and, you know, have their eyes opened or be at least curious about what's going on. So. Well, it is really a piece of work. I testify to that. And I think you, you name that you're not, you don't call yourself a historian, but a, a student of history. Um, and that this is a, a text that really engages history and philosophy and theology and uh, critical theory and political science and all these wrapped together. And you've just spoken to, uh, I mean, you started to open up these kind of uh, in, inherent hypocrisies <laughs> that are embedded in the very core of our national story uh, through these two central texts. Um, and, you, and you, I think, uh, use the language if somebody were to rewrite the Bible. And in, in fact, you, as you name in, in this book, uh, that actually did happen in a way, because you really tell um, about the slave Bible, um, the so-called Negro Bible. And I wonder if you would uh, for, uh, really uh, open up for, for those of us here in this circle, what is that slave Bible, and why was it so important and so radically uh, essential to this uh, critical piece around how white supremacy became embedded? Well, it was very interesting um, to me. Again, to go back to my house in Detroit with my mama, you know, there are certain things you don't mess with. You didn't mess with the Bible, just like you didn't question God, right? Um, so I had this attachment to the Bible, King James Version, right? And I have a Bible actually when I was at uh, at, at, at Jeremiah Wright's church it was it was an old Bible I carried it so much it was like falling apart but I kept carrying it and he told me he said you know you really can get a new Bible but I didn't know what I would do with the old one because you know, what do you do you don't throw it away what do you do with the Bible so it has that type of um, attachment for me but anyway um, geez um, there had been you know the, the assumption, of many were um, in present day, maybe not back then, is that, you know, Africans enslaved people were content with 
um, they're, they're locked and they did not uh, want them to get any ideas uh, about their freedom or their worth as human beings uh, that they might get from the Bible. And so it happened that some religious people in Great Britain decided, because they didn't want slave revolts and all that kind of stuff, they would just do a special Bible for the Africans, the Africans and the Africans Americans. And I need to say that I'm very, very, very conscious about not calling my ancestors slaves. And I, and I want people to not to do that. We were not slaves. We were enslaved. And so I find myself trying to get people to understand to say the enslaved people who were from Africa. I think it just does. I, I, with my kids, with my the kids I work with, I just stress that. So anyway, the people in Great Britain did not want the enslaved uh, Africans in the Caribbean or in, in America, they or in, they didn't just didn't want them to get any idea. So they redid the Bible. They rewrote it. I mean, how do you do that and not go to hell? I mean, I was stunned when I learned that. So they wrote the Negro Bible or the Slave Bible, and it just it's fascinating to me. And I and I and I and I read through some read it sometimes, and I just get mad. Um, and I, and I put it down, but we have to know this stuff. And 90% of the Old Testament and 50% of the New Testament were, were deleted in this Bible. 90% of the Old Testament. And the standard Protestant Bible, this book says there are 1,189 chapters, but the Bible given to the enslaved persons contains only 232 chapters. So from 1,189 chapters to 232 absent from the Bible were all of the Psalms, which express hopes for God's delivery from oppression, the entire book of Revelation. Uh, the book of Exodus excludes the story of the rescue of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, which is the story that gives the biblical book its title. But the Bible includes Exodus chapters 19 and 20, where God appeared on Mount Sinai and gives his law, the Ten Commandments. So I looked through and like the book of Genesis in our standard Bible, 50 chapters in the Negro Bible, 50, uh, 14. Exodus, standard Bible, 40 chapters in the Negro Bible, two chapters. Leviticus is not included. Numbers is not included. Deuteronomy, 34 chapters in our Bible. Um, um, uh, eight in the slave Bible. No Joshua, no Judges, no Ruth, only two chapters of First Samuel. It's just astounding to me that people would do that. I could be afraid because of the way I was raised that if I did something like that or, or even um, sanctioned something like that, that God would strike me down. I'm just saying, I would be afraid that I was going straight to hell. Um, all of the psalm, none of the psalms were included, as I just said. The Song of Solomon is not there. The Book of Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, not there. Um, Book of Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. So they just went through and it's like slashed stuff out on the in the Gospels. Um, the gospel, gospel of Matthew was left pretty much intact. Uh, none of Mark, none of the Gospel of Mark is included. Uh, Luke is okay, and John has six of its 21 chapters. It's just an astounding thing to look at. It's just astounding. Um, and so when you read that and you go back and you read some of the catechism lessons that the enslaved people were given, you know, kind of tells them that, you know, God wants them to be enslaved and they're not supposed to do anything that's going to, um, you know, uh, uh, threaten their salvation, like the don't drink and don't do anything vile. It was just amazing that the words that they were taught to use, um, you begin to see the, the deep rootedness of, of white supremacy. You, you, you really begin to see it. And they used religion to justify and sanction and support their ideology. That's what, was, that's what happened. And they were able to convince people that God was okay with it. God was okay with that. They had to do that. They had to make people think because you know what I believe is that I think in, inside of all of us, God puts the capacity for compassion and caring and people would, would have been like tormented, I think, if they hadn't gotten some, um, some sanction, some, some reassurance that what they were doing to these other human beings was okay with God. And so that's what the white supremacist system did. They made it so that people would believe that what they were doing and how they were believing 
was all from God. Therefore, they were not going to hell. The people who took the their pastors and preachers and teachers taught them that slavery was not wrong and it wasn't, you know, it might, it might be evil, but it wasn't a sin. Uh, so they used all of the buzzwords that we have learned as people who practice Christianity. They learned all the buzzwords and then they thought, okay, well, it's okay because, you know, because God's okay with it because it's in the Bible. And that, that marriage, Ethan, between church and state, that very, very, um, slippery uh, marriage between church and state where the church supported what the state was teaching and the state looked to the church for the support of what it was doing, helped contribute to the depth and the breadth of white supremacy in our, not only in our country, but in, in, in the world, because America taught the whole world how to treat people of African descent. It's an awful history. It's an awful, awful history. And we don't know it. Um, and so when things are going on, like, the things are going on now because people don't know. They you know they know their their history lesson at George Washington. I always go to this one that we were taught George Washington never told a lie, which is a lie. Everybody lies. What you know? But um, uh, telling these stories that 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 helped contribute to the portrait of America as somehow being exceptional. It's 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 a false it's a false image. It's a false image. So. That's fascinating. I mean, I, th I felt like in reading that, I, that it should have been titled um, the redacted Bible or something like that, you know, like uh, putting it in our modern day context. And I was really gripped by some of the examples that you gave. Um, for instance, I mean, you reference uh, two, two or three that come to mind were the Jubilee year, which I think in terms of for those of us in our modern day uh, movements who think of the notion of jubilee, we think of that as a, a the notion of uh, both celebration, but um, the coming to to righteousness and, and and justice and so forth. And it was fascinating to me to have it tied to that this was actually some period of time where um, those who uh, uh, enslaved other humans felt like no matter what that they could be enslaved for this amount of time for. Uh, seven times seven for 49 years before even a concept of uh, something uh, emerging from that could, could happen. And, and you referenced the golden rule and how that was misinterpreted and, 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 and uh, misappropriated. Um, and I think um, uh, someone uh, you know, who grew up uh, uh, in an Episcopal or Anglican church, I, I, I of course was caught by those uh, particular references and, uh, the the framework that you name of people in Virginia, for instance, having to be uh, part of the Anglican Church at that point. But you, uh, I, I remember growing up in the church that I, that I grew up in, a wonderful uh, congregation. Um, that uh, there was a point where I maybe went to someone else's church once, and I I was struck by the fact that like I was used to us talking about God in this place that, uh, where I worshipped that day. They talked about Jesus, and you really bring that into sharp clarification. Um, this difference between white uh, Christianity and um, Christianity of those of African descent who had, um, uh, and the, the claiming of Jesus the Christ. Um, and so, I wonder if you talk about that, and particularly, may, maybe it's tied to uh, the Bible that you just held up. The the differentiation between the words of Paul and those of Jesus, um, and how that those were really pulled and separated from one another. Yes, the, um, there really is a profound difference. And I actually have a United Methodist pastor friend here, and, and she and I were talking, and, and I was telling her about this. I said, there's a profound difference, even in your spirit, when you call Jesus by his name, Jesus, and when you say Christ. Jesus was his name, Christo, so Christ was his office. So walking around and calling him Christ is divorcing yourself from the person. You know, the, the notion, it, it makes God feel very, very, very far away. Um, and it, I don't know, maybe it feels like you, you have a little bit more leeway to do what you want to do. But when you say Jesus, something happens, you know, so it says in the Bible that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Um, but at the name of Jesus, something happens. It's like you calling me Susan, as opposed to calling me pastor. It's different. There's something 
different. I um, preached in a Lutheran church a couple of weeks ago and all through their liturgy was Christ, Christ, Christ. And I, and I read it because, you know, I was in their church and I um, needed to respect their space, but it, it doesn't draw you closer. And I think that um, for people of African descent, uh, and, and I don't know, now this, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't researched the, you know, how the name of Jesus came to be um, a standard in African-American communities. Um, but I would bet that they needed something, you know, you know, have a little talk with Jesus, something that made them believe that the God that these white people were telling them about was not as mean and as um, in favor of, 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 of their being beaten and raped and, and ignored and not treated as human beings, they had to do something different. So they called on Jesus, have a little talk with Jesus, tell him all about your struggles. You know, we needed something to help us hold on to the hope that we absolutely had to have as people to get through what we were going through. And so this friend of mine here in Columbus, you know, actually started, you know, we talked about it several times and she said, you know, you're right. She said, I've started using the word Jesus in service and in the liturgy, she said, and you're right. It does make a difference. It does. It, it, I, I wish I could explain. I wish there was a scientific way to explain it, but it really is different. But um, so that, 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 that calling Jesus by me, um, I think helped um, the enslaved people um, endure and survive what they went through. They were not regarded as human beings. And so the things that were done to them, um, people didn't feel bad about because they didn't think they were human. Um, Howard Thurman has this story where he, um, where he illustrates as he was talking about a time when he was uh, raking up the leaves, you know, back in the middle ages, when I was little, when you, when the leaves fell, you know, you raked them up and you put them in the street and you, you know, put them on fire and it was a wonderful, you know, it's fine. So he was raking up the leaves and putting them in the piles and this little white girl would come by and he, she kept, you know, um, messing up the pile. So finally Howard Thurman says, um, can you like stop that? You know, because he was trying to do this work and it's not get paid. And the little girl looked at him and she was kind of indignant and she stuck him with a pin. She had some type of a hat pin and she stuck him with a pin and he said, ow. And she said, why did you say ow? And he just looked at her and he said, she said, you people don't feel pain. Oh, okay. Okay. There's so many examples of things being done to people of African descent because we were treated as subhumans. And of course, you know, if you didn't, if you felt like Christ, you know, the tran the notion of the transcendent God just so far away, you don't even have to worry about that. You know, you call on, on Christ when you go to church for your hour-long service, but then when you walk out, you're on your own. And I think that that had a profound effect um, on the way. Um, many white people, not all, of course, but many white people treated people who were enslaved or not enslaved, who just happened to be black or brown or whatever. So, um, but then there's a, an interesting thing. You know, the, one of the foundational principles of my book, there's like two foundations. You know, the all men are created equal. That's the constitutional foundational statement. And um, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself, that's the biblical foundation. So those are two foundational statements. And um, people, many people, I, I say in the book that many people who call themselves Christian are not Christian because I think in order to be Christian, you got to do what Jesus says, period. I mean, why call yourself a Christian if you're going to ignore what Jesus says? And people ignore. Um, I think it was Robert Byrd. Uh, was questioned one time, the late Senator Robert Byrd from West Virginia. And um, he um, was questioned because he was a devout Christian. He was a devout Christian. And he was being questioned about his racism and, and all of that. And then the, the reporter said, don't you go to church? Yeah, I go to church. And she, I'm a devout Christian. I love the Lord Jesus. And um, this, she said, well, um, you know the story of the Good Samaritan? And he said, yeah, of course, I know the story of the Good Samaritan. She said, well, don't you know you're supposed to love your neighbor? And he said, of course, I know I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but I get to choose my neighbor. Oh, you say, I, I didn't learn that. 
I didn't learn that. I learned that you're supposed to love, like my mom said when we were watching the people with the hoses and the dogs, you gotta love everybody. You have to do it because that's what Jesus said to do. So I think many people are religious, Ethan. They go to churches that are Christian churches in name, but they ignore the words of Jesus. I have heard people after a sermon, I'm not gonna forgive people. I don't have to love people that I don't like. I don't have to do any of that. But how can you then call yourself a Christian if you're not willing to do that? Being a Christian is very hard and sometimes distasteful, to be honest. And so they go to the words of Paul. Paul is, you know, he's much more hierarchical in his things. You do this and you're good, you do this and you're bad, da-da-da-da-da-da. And it makes it easier for them to do what Paul says. He kind of um, allows for the, the separation of peoples and the separation of genders. And so he, he allows for that. And people go to church and some of them I've read, they don't ever hear the name of Jesus unless it's, Christ, unless it's Christmas or Easter. Well, that doesn't make you Christian. That doesn't make you Christian. So I have come to believe, and I say all the time, that just because you go to a Christian church does not mean that you are Christian. You can be religious. You can even be Paulists. Let's make up a name. If you if you follow the Pauline epistles, let's call you Paulists. But you are not Christian. So then I thought about that when on January 6th, and they had that, I don't remember if you, if I don't know if you remember how they, some of the people were in the, the Senate chambers and they were just like being destructive. They're just going hog wild, doing whatever they wanted. And that guy that had the horns on and the tattoos and all that kind of stuff, he said, wait, 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 we got to pray. We got to pray. He said, we got to pray and he stopped. And they lifted up holy hands and they asked for God's presence and God's anointing on what they were doing. And I said, whose God are you praying to? So that's why even in this book, and I make some of my very much more um, religious friends angry, I said, there's not one God. We don't have a monotheistic society, a monotheistic Christian society. It is at least, it, it is at least, we at least have two gods. We have at least one, a, a one for white people and one for black people, at least. I don't know, there may be more. But I don't think for a minute if I was forced to worship this God of my white friends that thinks that lynching people is okay and not providing um, quality education for little school children is okay and uh, um, saving money and letting uh, children drink water from lead pipes is okay, then I, I wouldn't want to worship that God. I would just be an atheist. I would just say the hell with it because I, I, I need a God that is greater than the problems and greater than the, the, the issues that are killing me and my people and the people, the people I love and the people I don't love. I need a God that's bigger than that. And if the God that, that I'm supposed to worship is just like, you know, Joe Blow from, you know, the neighboring town, I don't need that. I don't need that. You're echoing at some level, you have some really telling quotes from James Baldwin, certainly sprinkled through the text. Uh, one of them that really struck me was, um, was Baldwin saying, was heaven then to be merely another ghetto? And uh, really uh, evokes that, uh, just his, his naming again and again, the whiteness of the God that has been presented to, to him as a young uh, Black child and, 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 and to Black people in this country. Um, I think it's really fascinating how you talk about um, these these contrasts. As you know, FOR is a multi-faith movement and interfaith movement has been for many decades. And so we could get more into that, like what these stories mean, particular for people of so many different spiritual traditions. But so many in our time, in this time, uh, still consider... Um, this nation to be a Christian nation. There is that language that's yeah. used. And you really refute that. And you and you and you say that going back to its founding in 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 diverse ways in terms of and, and I would name a couple and really invite you to open that up. Um, uh, one is certainly again, um, I mean you're just talking about <laughs> Senator Byrd and, and also the, the Capitol insurrection. You were talking about the, the halls of this this hallowed chambers, which were not, of course, present at that point in the uh, 18th century, but nevertheless, those who, who wrote the documents, the Constitution, the Declaration, and that many of them were similarly were not 
Christian, uh, either in terms of their practice or even in terms of maybe what they subscribe to. Um, so there was that piece and, and really the pushback within some of those um, critical uh, writers uh, for something that would be named as Christian in terms of this country. So that's one piece. And then the other is, a, is that um, you really name, and I think in fascinating ways, again, as, as a child of the North, in terms of my own life, I live in the South now, but I grew up in New York State and, and so forth. The ways that Northern uh, Christianity, Northern white Christians were deeply and profoundly complicit in terms of the framework of white supremacy in our country from the Puritans. And I mean, you were naming the Exodus story uh, a short while ago and, and how they saw entirely different language for the Exodus story, maybe than, than um, people of African descent to, and congregationalists uh, to uh, Anglicans and other traditions that were in the North and how they played a role. So I wonder if you could talk about some of those components um, about uh, about these these juxtapositions. Yeah, I was um, really fascinated. Of course, I've always learned, I've always heard that this is a Christian nation, that the founders are Christian. That's what we, most of us learned. I won't say all of us. I don't know what everyone was, was taught. I was taught that. So then I began to read, and I'm thinking, all these guys now, all of them grew up in the church. You know, there, many of them were Episcopalians. I, I think in the book, I, I have a table someplace where it talks about what their actual religions were. Um, but when it came to defining the country, they were explicit about saying this is not a Christian nation. And many of them, um, you know, even though they at, at, um, they acknowledge that Jesus um, existed, they did not call themselves Christian. They called themselves deists, deists. They believed in God. They thought Jesus was cool. But they did not accept the metaphysical components of Jesus. They did not accept all the miracles and they did not. Ex and they were very explicit in writing it down that this was not to be a Christian nation. So when I hear people say that, I just go back and 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 review, you know, what I've read. Uh, they they I, I there's this guy, um, the founding fathers. Um, uh, what's his face? Uh, Pain created, believed in a distant deity, uh, many of them, whom they called nature's God and Oliver Wendell Holmes. And he said that um, this um, nature's God was also used in the Declaration of Independence. And he said deism subverted Orthodox Christianity. We, we don't know that. So people you know, get on the high horse. This is Christian nation. This is Judeo, but it wasn't. It really was not. Um, um, and 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 it really um, has done a lot to give white supremacists or Christian nationalists a false sense of what? A false sense of their privilege and being, you know, so I'm a Christian. And, they're, and they go back to the founding fathers, but it shows that they, like none of us, none of us, we don't know the history, we, we weren't taught that, but they were very explicit. And they, you know, they had come from, um, not so long ago, a very, um, what they would describe as a tyrannical, a country where there was a tyrannical relationship between church and state. And so what they really did not want was a repeat of the in intrusion of the church into the business of the state in this country, although, like I said, these 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 two entities were you know, bedfellows from the very beginning, but they were very very adamant about um, about saying that they were not Christian. They they uh, and they used deistic terms for God, but they sometimes added a, a Christian dimension to what they were doing. So they would say merciful providence or divine goodness, but they were not trying to call out Jesus. They just were not doing it, and so. Um, it was that that's something that's a um, that's a fallacy. That's a myth. That's as much of a myth in terms of us being a Judeo Christian nation as is this whole thing about American exceptionalism. It's just a it's just a myth. But it does think, you know, we need myths to keep our cells glued together. Sometimes the myths keep us sane. But that's a myth like all myths. And it, it isn't it isn't true. You had a second question. You had a second part of your question. I, I, I forgot it. 
Well, I think I was just uh, looking at different ways that this this notion of a Christian nation, uh, you do really break it apart. And um, I, I, again, I think uh, maybe the second piece was really naming um, the how while the South was, of course, at the heart of um, both the the creation and deepening of the, of the slave um, trade, um, the that um, the the North and, and churches in the North were as inherently um, uh, participatory, in it. and I think as I read some of that, I, I perhaps was thinking a little bit about um, Reverend Dr. King's letter from Birmingham Jail and really demanding the, uh, the that white liberals. Um, take it upon ourselves to be as engaged as uh, those who might be deemed, you know, really uh, uh, in support of um, racist uh, white supremacist action. So uh, I don't know if there's more that you'd like to say about kind of that part participation of um, uh, so, so-called liberal and, and progressive movements um, in, in this, the North. Well, you know, and I was, I, I really thank you for, for lifting that because I really needed to lift that up. You know, this is, again, we're talking about myths. The myths that all oh, the North really liked the Black people. No, the North did not like the Black people. They did not. Um, their, their churches were just as segregated as were the ones in the South. They, you know, Black people were okay as long as they stayed in their place. Listen, it, it was a caste system. We were readily identifiable by our color. And so, you know, people have the need to feel better than, and it was taught, the lesson was taught that whatever you are as a white person, at least you're not Black. There was resentment. You know, people were taught that if you're white, you deserve more. That's that privilege thing. I just wish white people would just own it. You know, we're privileged. Okay, and stop to stop denying it, um, but you were, you, you, you were deserving of more because you were white. And so, um, you know, you've heard of the riots that would break out if a, if a corporation or a factory went on strike and then the, the, the factory people would bring black people in and then with this great big, you know, great big riot and killing people because they're taking our jobs. It's just, it's just, the history is just, it's just dotted with um, how, uh, the, this this conflict because of this this felonious uh, the, this erroneous uh, message sent to to white people you are better than everyone else therefore you can do what you want to do now people will deny it but that's what and we see it playing out and you know it's it's interesting I, I'm I'm going to jump back for a second if you allow me because the um, the role of the church the silence of the church the silence of liberals. And the participate the participation of liberals in this stuff it can really you know, it can make your heart hurt if you really read it. So when um, some time ago, and I put this in the book, um, we took my church when I was still at my church. I took my choir to Africa, and we were singing all around different parts of, in West Africa. And we went to um, a slave castle in West Africa, and um, we we toured it. And it, it's it's heartbreaking. It, it's just heartbreaking to go to visit that and see this place that, that they brought human beings in and they stuffed them in these dungeons and, you know, dungeons that could, could probably rightfully hold maybe 50 or 60 people. They just stuffed hundreds of people in there and they're dark and there are no windows and it's hot. And if they died or when they died, they just had to be staying in there with these dead and decomposing people and people. It was awful. It was it was the middle passage before the middle passage. Anyway, we we toured all of that. Um, and, and being in those dungeons was like, you know, you could almost hear still the cries of the people who had been in those those spaces. So that night, um, we did a concert in the slave castle and we were singing song many rains ago that's done by um, Quincy Jones. And we were right next to the dungeon where African men were held because women were held on the other side. African men were held um, in captivity before they were led out and went, went through the portico to go through the door of no return to get on a canoe, to be taken out to the ship that would take them forever away from their home. And we had been in there. We, we, we had been in that dungeon. We had, we had, we had tasted the, the heat and the sweat and the tears and the blood that was still in there. Um, and it did something to us. You know, you don't even know sometimes what's been done to you until something happens that makes you understand what was done. 
we were getting ready to sing the song many rains ago. And I happened to look up before I started directing the choir and right over that dungeon was an Episcopal church. You, you, you saw the great big old steeple and the cross on top of the steeple. And I broke down because here was the, here was the failure of religion. Here was the failure of Christianity. Here was the failure of the message of Jesus the Christ who, who taught that all people had worth. Here, this was the message of Jesus, that the word and the work of Jesus. He went and talked to everybody and touched everybody, the sick people and the women and all of the untouchables. He touched them and loved them and included them. But here on top of this dungeon was this church. And I read later on that um, while the people were stuffed in that dungeon, um, the people in the Episcopal church in their Sunday best just sang the hymns of Zion while the people below them were screaming and yelling in agony. It, when you think about that, and then you have to think about where we are today. That is why we are where we are today. This is so deep. This goes so deep. And it's and and it and it isn't something obviously that that happened um recently it didn't start in the in the united states with the um with the slave trade it started way before that and it has just wreaked havoc with the um the capacity of people many people to love people for who they are it just has in spite of the bible and in spite of the constitution absolutely i mean as you know i lived in ghana um, a couple of years ago and visited some of those same uh, really hor- um, sites of horror and trauma. Um, and I, I remember that, um, you know, it's one of my most powerful memories from the, the castle uh, fortresses in Elmina and Cape Elmina. Coast um, and, um, and Accra even. There's one, you know, right there in the, the heart of uh, this, you know, city of five million now and so forth. And um, in the, I think the one in, in Accra, the the, the little uh, chapel is directly above uh, the dungeon, you know, right there, as you say, you know, where, where the, the people were dying and being uh, uh, carried away. So it's really uh, Osu uh, is the one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, I mean, I think, and, um, and I want to invite, um, again, our, our audience, if you have any comments or questions for our guest, uh, Reverend Dr. Susan uh, William Smith, um, you are invited to either put them into the chat or raise your hand. Um, we have a time for uh, two, three, maybe four questions. Uh, we can go till uh, about 15 minutes after the hour with our guest. Um, and I, I would love, uh, Susan, to uh, maybe... <sighs> There's so much more to talk about in terms of like you, you bring the, the this legacy from the 1400s, uh, really you know through the 1800s and, and all these pieces um, during that period, and uh, in, in naming what it was that was done and what was written, <laughs> um, and how that uh, how that and how and the, those things that weren't written. I really thought it was fascinating uh, you naming the things that were really implicit maybe in the constitution, but not actually present there. And so um, I, in a moment, I think I'd love to maybe move to just one or two thoughts about how that foundation continues to, to lead forward to today. Um, uh, but but if, I wonder if you could talk a bit about that, about the, the leaving out, uh, the things that were unsaid um, that were yet nevertheless um, very much the framework uh, of these, these foundational documents that we cite. Um, I think the best way to, um, to answer that is to refer to something that I read just very recently. You know, there's all this hoopla about critical race theory, which to me is like really dumb because I don't think many people who are yelling about critical race theory even know what it is. They just hear the word race and they just go like crazy nuts. It's just nuts. It's just nuts. But this lady was at one of the school board meetings and she said that she didn't want her children to be taught critical race theory um, because she didn't want the, the world to think that 
she didn't want her children to be hated. Or she said something about critical race theory will make children hate each other. And I thought, well, white children already kind of have an attitude against black kids, but I just, you know, I just read it and it was listening. It was a, it was a video um, or a report. And then she, she kept talking. She said, and I really, that's what I really believe. And then she broke into tears and she said, and I am not a racist. So the unspoken thing um, that, that, that abides in this society is that everybody, let me just, let me just say something that's maybe really radical. All of us, black and white, have been taught to be white supremacist in our minds. All of us. Um, African people of African descent fought against it, but all of us were taught by the same teachers. Um, even when the black church was, was founded when Absalom Jones and, and um, Richard Allen broke away from the Methodist Episcopal Church and started the AME Church. They came with the theology that had been taught to them by white theologians, white pastors. Now they, you know, they, so much of what they taught the black people who the biggest, the biggest advantage in having a black church is that they could sit where the heck they wanted to sit and they didn't have to, you know, sit up in the balcony and they didn't have to suffer, you know, all types of discrimination in the house of God. But in terms of the theology, it was the same. It was the same. And so the unspoken things, that is the seedbed of all of us, all of us. And, you know, we as Black people have to own that and white people need to own it too. I mean, you know, you just can't get away from that. It is there. We have to be able to say, it's like saying I am an alcoholic. You know, we are a white supremacist nation. All of us have been taught the same lessons and we don't want to talk about that. So we want to act like, and I, and I, and I, and I was, I was doing a sermon once in um, Charlestown, West Virginia. That's the place where um, uh, John Brown was ha hanged. Um, and I was invited to, to preach at an Episcopal church, a very conservative, rich, white, conservative church. And I thought, you know, every once in a while, God will put you in a situation. You have to laugh and say, God has jokes. What the hell? What am I doing here? And so um, I just kind of stood there for a minute and, and, and looked. Um, and I, you know, I had to let them know that, you know, I'm not here to, you know, blame anybody. You know, I know none of you guys own slaves. And there was this like pregnant pause for a moment. And then they cracked up, you know, because that's always the thing. I didn't do it. I didn't own slaves. I know all of you, none of you own slaves. And I said, and I know you probably have one or two colored friends. I had to say it because what happens is in this country, if you have one or two colored friends, then you think you're not racist. That's the unspoken thing. So this lady in the school board meeting talking about, I don't want my children to be taught critical race theory. She really believes she's not racist. She cannot see what her, even her spirit, even her spirit is communicating to her children, com communicating that we are better than that. We don't have to read that. You don't have to listen to that. That's the unspoken stuff that is damaging it's very, very, very damaging. We just go around with blinders on our eyes. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not racist. And it's like, yeah, you are. Just say it. So now once you say it, then maybe we can do something about it. But if you keep pretending, if you are an alcoholic and you keep saying you're not an alcoholic, you're going to be an alcoholic till you die, right? I mean, that, that's what they say, right? You got to say it. You got to say, I got a problem. And when we can say that, then we open up the possibility for change and healing and all that. But if you never say it, and I, you know, I just read something just today where, um, um, what's his face that did that, that, that formulated the um, critical race theory. His, his name will come back to me in a minute, but. Derek Bell. Yeah. Derek Bell. He said, racism is forever. It's never going to go away. And one of the reasons why is because nobody wants to admit it. 
So you have Stephen Miller saying, I'm not racist. Or you have the former president. What the heck? Saying, I'm the least racist person you've ever met. Yeah, you have people like that. Then and and we walk around with that, you know, because I have a color friend, because I guess because he, you know, he brought uh, Kanye West into the White House or uh, that doesn't make you a, a human being when it comes to this issue of race. It's about the policies. White nationalism is about using the name of God to um, to sanction the policies that they have to keep the separation and the and the enmity and the divisions and the poverty keep those in place. It's about doing that. And so um, that's the unspoken stuff. I'm not racist. I got two colored friends. I'm not racist. I let my kid go over to little so-and-so's house. And it's, it, we don't understand it because we, I think many of us don't understand it because we don't want to, because it's painful. Just like it's painful to say I'm an alcoholic. It's painful to say I'm a drug addict. It is painful to say, I am a racist. Indeed. And I think you really mean that it's that personalization <laughs> that, um, that really people struggle with and, and the disassociation from, um, uh, from what is around us. Like, I mean, people sometimes will just describe this as the air we breathe or the water that we're in, but um, uh, if you can't see it or whatever, then it's easy to, <laughs> to not um, uh, identify with it. Um, and I appreciated this um, question that was put into the chat by one of our audience members, um, Ellen Lundin, who um, asked uh, if you are aware of one of the uh, projects by um, uh, uh, people who are descendants of one of the largest slave only, uh, not sorry, excuse me. Um, Katrina Brown is a filmmaker who created a film called Traces of the Trade. And you may or may not be available, uh, aware of it. Um, and as a descendant of a family, a Rhode Island family that were involved in the shipping industry um, that uh, played such an immense role in the, the transatlantic slave trade, um, even though in, in that experience, uh, people may be in that area of Rhode Island and elsewhere would, again, put um, the question of slavery in a different place. She really sought to dig deep uh, into her own family lineage and how uh, they were engaged in this uh, history over uh, over centuries um, and, and to tie it specifically to her family's connection to the Episcopal Anglican uh, Church mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, um, uh, so ultimately, what that leads to is a, um, this kind of deep question of a pro the process of asking for forgiveness and seeking a, uh, and trying to build a process of atonement. You might uh, also use language of repair. And so I wonder if you might, even if you haven't seen the film and don't know about that project directly, think about um, these questions, re respond to these questions for white people who are really trying to reckon with that in their own uh family lineage, whatever that may be, uh, wherever their family uh, may, may have come to this, to these shores from Europe at whatever point, um, and what it means to be kind of in, in seeking a process of ultimately, hopefully again, reconciliation, but what that looks like in terms of repair, uh, atonement, uh, forgiveness, um, what are the steps? Yeah, that's a, a, an important thing. You know, you cannot heal People are always talking about healing. I remember when Barack Obama was in, was elected. And they said, "Oh, it's a post-racial society," and I said, "Okay, I'll be stupid today. You cannot be post-racial until you acknowledge uh, what the racism has been and what it has done." Nobody was willing to do that. Um, yeah, all of us have to own stuff in our own personal relationships. You know, if, if between a, a, a parent and a child, you know, if, if there is a problem, you're not going to fix it until you admit it. If you've been wrong, if you've done something wrong to your child, you know, uh, or child, or the or the child has done something wrong with the parent, you have to admit it. I was wrong. It's hard to say it. I was wrong. I was just wrong. Um, and people are not willing to say that we still live in this in this bastion of 
of, of make believe where we have to believe that we're just really good people. And if the Africans, the people of African descent didn't have a good life, well, it's something that they didn't do, but it wasn't us because we gave them everything that they needed. You know, just that that pure denial of what happened. You got to admit it. Um, I remember years ago, I interviewed Billy Graham and, and I was mad at him because I said, you, you are, you know, the, he was at that time, the leading televangelist in the country. And I said, all you have to do is stand up to all those thousands of people that you talk to and say, you know, we got to admit this. We got to say that it was wrong. And he looked at me and he said, the only way um, this race problem is going to be handled or ended is if we start to eat with one another or have fellowship with one another. And I thought, what are you talking about? I was really young, you know, I had a lot to learn, but I didn't understand, but I understand it now. And that when you can sit down with people um, whom you do not particularly like or trust, um, people who you know have wronged you um, and just, you know, have a conversation, not an argument, just a conversation. Um, that begins the process. When the process begins and there's some of the defensiveness can be broken down and trust can be begun to be built and then it can lead to a path of reconciliation. But this country has never admitted, never admitted that it has been wrong when it has come to race in the, in the treatment of African, people of African descent and, and, and by now other people, other groups as well. The, the Native Americans, they've never, never apologize for what the the genocide that was done um, by people of, of Caucasian descent when they came to this country. There can be no healing until there and no reconciliation until there's honesty. There has to be confrontation of the issue and it, it, and and a willingness to admit uh, that we were wrong. Period. I think this might be the last question that uh, we'll take. Um, this one comes from uh, Roy Burchard, um, who uh, I think picking up on some of your earlier points, Susan, about um, uh, when you were talking about that radically redacted Bible that was given to people of African descent, um, he names that um, Reginald Fuller, who's a New Testament scholar from England, um, but who he thinks uh, may, may have ended up here in, in the South, in the Carolinas, spoke of the canon within the canon. Mm. Um, and uh, in that, he, he apparently meant those of us who uh, uh, see, claim to be Christians choose what the canon or the collection of books within the biblical uh, um, canon. Um, why, do, why do humans all need to prune down the books of the Bible? Um, how many sermons have you ever heard about what's in the book of Second Kings? Uh, Roy refers to, he wrote about that. I'm um, just saying like, oh, we're just going to pull from here and there and not from these ones that we just don't like or want to deal with or uh, we find too troublesome or problematic. And so I wonder... We don't want to be troubled. We want to be comfortable. We want we want to be um, affirmed for what we believe, and we don't want anybody, not even God, bothering that. We don't. We don't. We, we want to be comfortable. You know, I am sure that there are many more pastors, white pastors, who would have spoken out against racism, or even sexism, or if if their people would have allowed them. They don't want to hear about that stuff. They just want to hear, you know, something that they can do so the whole service doesn't last longer than an hour. Say a little something, something, you know, go to the book of Paul, pull out a couple of little words, say something so that we feel good. We don't want to be challenged. We don't want to, you know, we don't we don't want you to tell us that we need to do something. We just want to be challenged. And if you do what we want you to do, we'll pay you. And it's, you know, it's a quid pro quo. You're the pastor. You need us. We may not need you, but you need us. You need for us to to pay our, our offering so that you can keep this church open and get a salary. I mean, it, it, it sounds so crass and so cold. But that's what it is. So how many church meetings have there been with, from, with pastors who have dared step out 
and and challenge the people. And I remember you have you read the book Born of Conviction, where these um, pastors in the South, uh, white pastors, were just just flum, flummoxed about what was going on with the racism, and they wrote a letter, and it was called the Born of Conviction that they thought it was wrong, and all of them ended up losing their churches, and some of them were run out of town, and so that's why people do it. They are complicit. Um, um, Brueggemann says that there is something called the collusion of silence or, or theology of silence, where silence is, is required um, so that the status quo can remain intact. At the end of the day, saving the status quo for many people is more important than doing the will of God. Well, you wrote about that this very morning. Uh, I want to really lift up to uh, everyone. I mean, again, this book, um, which is new uh, in terms of its publication, was, of course, written prior to uh, uh, January 6th of this year, but it is as relevant for, um, for the aftermath of the insurrection. This morning you spoke, uh, you cited uh, Walter Brueggemann and the Theology of Silence in your weekly column that you send out through different media. I want to uh, highlight to everyone, again, please, please purchase um, through however you get your books, um, With Liberty and Justice for Some, the Bible, um, the Constitution, and Racism in America. Um, but you can also sign up for Susan's regular um, messages uh, through your website, Crazy Faith Ministries. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I think it was, it, it strikes me that uh, I, I was saying to you shortly before um, the program started that at this very moment, um, literally at, at this perhaps this very, very moment, um, a great tragedy is happening uh, in our country, which is the a state ex execution of uh, an, an individual, a black man um, in Missouri, by the state of Missouri, um, by a state sponsored um, execution. And I in reading your book and, and the citations of uh, Doc, Dr. James Cohn, uh, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, it brought me back through that lineage of, um, of, from, uh, of centuries of white supremacy and how it's been expressed to this, this, again, this very hour when the state is, again, uh, using state-sponsored uh, form of violence to execute a determination upon a Black body. Um, and so I wonder if, if you, uh, to close us out, Susan, would offer any final words that you would like to share about um, this work and then maybe close us with uh, a prayer um, for the end of our time together today. Well, first, I want to thank you for inviting me and thank you guys for sitting and listening for this period of time. I appreciate it. Um, you know, uh, I spent a lot of t today thinking about how I feel kind of sad for my white brothers and sisters who don't realize how deep is this disease called white supremacy. I, I just feel sad. I feel like um, it's like an illness that, like a metastatic illness that people have and they don't even realize it. Um, and it just made me very, very sad. I don't remember what, what happened today because something happens every day, but, but I don't, it just made me sad. And so I, my hope and my prayer is maybe you read this book and other books because there's so many really good ones out and put yourself in a place where you force yourself to become uncomfortable for the purpose of healing. You know, when we get sick, we have to go through some stuff that we don't like, you know, needle in the arm, or, you know, surgery or something. We have to, usually when we're sick, we have to go through something in order to get well. And I think white supremacy and the way it has messed with our spirits is a sickness. I do, I do, I do. And so I wish that and hope that people will be willing to be uncomfortable in your own private space. Read something, read something that's so troubling to you that you have to put it down. You just have to put it down for a minute. And think about it and then pick it up again and, and, and keep reading and keep studying and become then one step in, this, in, the, in the thousands of steps that we all have to take in order to turn some of this stuff around. So thank you again for listening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. I hope you buy the book. And if you like it, I hope you 
ask others. And if you don't like it, I hope you still tell others to get it as well. So um, here we go. Spirit of the living God, you who brought us here, you who woke us up this morning, you who saw fit to give us this day, this time, this minute to be in our right minds. We thank you. We thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to have conversations, to teach the little that I know, and to maybe inspire other people to want to know, God, I don't think you want us this way. I don't think you do. I think you want us to be whole, but we are broken. And so I ask you to help us, each of us as individuals, do what we have to do to make the wholeness come. And I ask it in the name of Jesus the Christ. And if there are any people on this, in this meeting who are not Christian, I do it in the name of the deity in whom they believe as well. Amen and amen.